Okay, so we're recording now. Bismillah. Okay, so as I was saying, uh, I'm going to try to leave time at the end for questions, but there's quite a bit that I was hoping to get through. So you can always um, put questions in the chat, inshallah, and then I can, if I don't have time to get through them, I can answer them in the, on the groups, inshallah. Okay, bismillah. So um, today, inshallah, we're going to talk about natural relief and really more of prevention for PMS, which stands for premenstrual syndrome. So just gonna start by going over what exactly is PMS. So subhanAllah, PMS, long ago was actually thought of as an imaginary disease, um, which, you know, considering that long ago, the field of medicine was mainly uh, run by men. Uh, I guess you can kind of see why uh, that would be the case. Um, but, you know, sometimes I just wonder if men were to suffer every month with severe cramps and bloating and headaches and joint pain and constipation and fatigue and depression, would PMS still be, you know, dismissed as just all in the head, subhanAllah. Um, but it's estimated that as many as 85% of all women suffer from premenstrual syndrome. So that's, that's a large number, 85% um, at one time or another in their, in their life. So you are not alone. Um, and 5% of women suffer from the more serious and debilitating condition known as PMDD, which is premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Okay, so um, some common symptoms of PMS that can occur in the week or two preceding menstruation are listed here. And, you know, I know that a lot of us, um, you know, obviously we already know maybe too well are familiar with all of these symptoms, but something that happened the other day that made me really want to include this slide is that my daughter, my daughter's 15 years old. So, you know, she hasn't been menstruating for that long. And I was talking with her about some of this information and I was talking about how like muscle pain and joint pain and all these symptoms can be part of PMS. And she was really surprised and she, and she stopped and she said, you know, I, I, I get some of these symptoms, but I never really connected them with my period. Like I just thought, I don't know, it was just happening independently. Like, you know, the muscle pain and, you know, the, um, like changes in her appetite and things like that, you know, because she hadn't, you know, she's still pretty young and she hadn't been experiencing, you know, these symptoms for long. She didn't actually connect those with PMS. So I think it's important, you know, not only for us, but you, like if you have daughters, you know, to teach them that these symptoms can all be part of PMS. So um, we have two categories here. We have the emotional and behavioral symptoms, which can be tension, anxiety, feeling depressed, crying spells, mood swings, irritability, anger, um, changes in your appetite, food cravings, trouble falling asleep, social withdrawal, and poor concentration. And then the physical signs, you can have um, obviously the, you know, abdominal pain and bloating, but also joint pain, muscle pain, headache, fatigue, weight gain, which is related to the fluid retention, um, breast tenderness, acne flare up, and then either constipation or diarrhea. So there's really a lot of, you know, different symptoms that can be um, occurring during this time. Okay, so I want to get a little bit into what exactly causes PMS, okay? Because obviously in order to, um, you know, prevent these symptoms from happening, inshallah, and, you know, curing ourselves from these symptoms, obviously we need to know what is causing it in the first place, especially because it can be different for each woman. So um, one of the causes can be hormonal imbalance. So it's going to be too much estrogen and not enough progesterone. And we'll talk in a second about um, what can cause too much estrogen. I'm going to make this bigger. Can you see better now since I made that bigger? Okay. So, um, we have the hormonal imbalance, too much estrogen, a poor diet, which is going to lead to 
deficiencies in vitamins and minerals. And we'll talk more later about specifically what vitamins and minerals you can be deficient in that can make your PMS symptoms worse. Um, unstable blood sugar levels, a sluggish liver, which is, sorry, I can't see my slides when I do that. Um, a, a sluggish liver, which is unable to break down hormones and cleanse the body of toxins. And then in some people, food allergies, so especially gluten and dairy, sometimes you can have a, it may not necessarily be an allergy, it could just be an intolerance to gluten or dairy or other foods, and that can cause, lead to inflammation in the body, and then that can make your symptoms worse. Okay, so as I mentioned, too much estrogen can often be the culprit for PMS. So what can cause too much estrogen in your system? So it could be, as we mentioned, an issue with the liver. So your liver is not able to clear estrogen from, from your body in the normal way that it should. And so that can lead to um, increased PMS symptoms. Uh, if you're constipated, if you struggle with constipation, that could be contributing to old estrogen being reabsorbed. Um, there may also be extra estrogens and what we call estrogen mimickers, which are chemicals that can come in to your body from either dietary sources, uh, such as, for example, dairy products, like the conventional dairy products, or foods that are packaged in plastic. So um, you can see this slide here. Um, things like toothpaste, deodorant, antibacterial soap, body wash, nail polish, plastic wrap, laundry products. So a lot of these, um, the BPA in aluminum cans and in plastic bottles, even subhanAllah, things like cash register receipts um, contain BPA. So all of these, you know, contact with all of these can bring these estrogen mimickers um, into the body and, you know, contribute to this, to your symptoms. Uh, oops, sorry. Okay, so what do we do about it? Um, what are some things that we can do to prevent, you know, inshallah, these symptoms, or at least to make them, you know, hopefully make them go away completely, but if not, at least to minimize these symptoms. So step one is going to be a nourishing diet. If you're giving yourself all of the nutrients, vitamins, minerals, so that your body can, you know, your liver can function properly, your, your, um, your digestive system is moving, moving smoothly. All of these, you know, are really going to help to minimize your symptoms. So eating a whole nutrient dense diet, which is of course, lots of veggies and fruits, choosing complex carbohydrates over refined carbs. So um, for example, the complex carbs that would be found in things like sweet potatoes, in whole grains, beans, and fruit, um, you know, making these choices as much as possible rather than like the white bread, white rice, white pasta, you know, the refined carbs. And drinking enough water is really important because, you know, as we mentioned with um, people who are suffering from constipation, and then the, you're not, your body's not going to be able to clear that excess estrogen. So lots and lots of water uh, throughout the day. And the way that I always like to look at it, you know, when you, if you're, if you realize that, okay, I need to make some changes in my diet, I need to, you know, include more, um, nourishing foods and maybe cut out, you know, certain things from my diet, processed foods or, you know, fast foods or things like that. Try to, um, view it in a way, not that you're depriving yourself of something, but as an opportunity for healing, you know, one bite at a time. So, you know, yes, there may be processed and unhealthy foods that you need to cut out, but rather than focusing on that negative aspect of it, that, oh, I'm going to be, um, you know, deprived of these certain foods, try to focus on, um, you know, the positive that you're giving yourself this um, opportunity to heal, you know, through those, all of those nourishing foods that you're going to be incorporating into your diet, inshallah. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, nutrient deficiencies can be one um, cause of having really severe PMS symptoms. So these are the nutrients that 
you know, if, if you're lacking in them, it can make your PMS symptoms very intense. Calcium, magnesium, vitamins K and E, B vitamins, and antioxidants, which are found in foods that are rich in vitamin C, E, and selenium. So by trying to correct these um, nutrient deficiencies, inshallah, it can really help with your symptoms. Okay, so uh, what are some of the foods that you can try to incorporate into your diet in order to get these nutrients, inshallah? So what I would like everyone to do is as we go through this list, is kind of just um, maybe identify one or two foods on here that you're not used to having in your diet and then just kind of make the intention that, you know, over the next week or two, I'm, I'm going to try to incorporate these foods, you know, into my diet more. You know, I, I always find that taking baby steps, you know, rather than just completely trying to, um, you know, completely redo your diet, like a makeover of your diet can be really stressful and, you know, it's often not sustainable. So, just step by step, you know, just maybe think of a couple of these foods that you could include into your diet more. So as we mentioned, calcium, being low in calcium can, um, you know, make your symptoms worse. So calcium rich foods such as raw milk, broccoli, cooked kale, yogurt, um, kefir is one of my favorite. Sorry, I'm having issues with this. I can't see the slide when I make it big like that. Okay, sorry. Uh, sardines is another good choice, uh, a good source of calcium. Um, if anyone's not familiar with what kefir is, we can discuss that more on the group, but basically it's um, a fermented drink that you can make at home really easily. And it's just bursting with uh, probiotics, really beneficial drink. Um, high fiber foods, because as we mentioned, you know, with constipation can be an issue in making your symptoms worse. So these, the high fiber foods are basically going to bind to that estrogen and help your body to eliminate it, that, uh, that extra estrogen. Um, healthy fats, so things like avocado, um, nuts and seeds, you know, avocado, not only does it contain healthy fats, but it contains so many other nutrients that can help to combat, combat PMS symptoms. Uh, leafy greens. So these are going to be a great source of magnesium, calcium, and vitamin K. Um, if you're not crazy about salads, you know, you can always, you know, put a bunch of leafy greens in a smoothie. Um, I find that especially useful if you have kids who, you know, are not excited about eating leafy greens is you can make a smoothie. I like to make a smoothie with kefir and put some fruit in there and um, leafy greens. Um, Eggs, garlic, onions, and beans. These are all rich in sulfur containing amino acids. So you can try to incorporate more of those into your diet. Uh, flax seeds, which will promote healthy estrogen metabolism. And then probiotic rich foods is really gonna help with um, you know, the health of your gut. So as I mentioned earlier, kefir, or there's things like sauerkraut and kimchi. So these are naturally fermented um, vegetables that have a, contain a lot of probiotics. And turmeric, which is a powerful antioxidant and it detoxifies, it's, it can help to stabilize your mood and it, even, it can even help to ease cramps. So turmeric is a, is a really great, you can make like a golden milk with turmeric. And then wild caught fish, that's gonna help with your um, omega-3 intake. So inshallah, um, you know, as I said, if you can maybe think of one or two of these foods that you don't, that you're typically not used to eating and think about how you can incorporate it into your diet and shawl. And as I mentioned before, many people have trouble digesting gluten and dairy. So eating these foods can contribute to an inflammatory state in your body, which can make your PMS symptoms worse. So I always advise people to try like an elimination diet where they, you know, just cut out these foods from about three weeks and then, you know, or, you know, in this case, maybe do it, um, like for a month so that you can see your next cycle, how it's going to affect your symptoms. And a lot of times just, you know, gluten, dairy, and sugar is the other big one that when people cut out these three, they notice really, really, uh, remarkable, you know, improvements in their symptoms. So that's worth you know, giving it a try, inshallah. 
And then what foods do, would we like to avoid foods that can trigger PMS? So as I mentioned, sugar, especially in the week before your symptoms are expected, you can just be more aware of, you know, trying to cut down on your sugar intake. Um, cut the caffeine as, you know, as much as you can. And subhanAllah, studies show that you are four times more likely than others to have severe PMS when you have a high intake of caffeine. So, um, you know, if it's coffee that you love, maybe try to switch to decaf or herbal teas. Um, you know, you can, you know, and, and if that's difficult for you, you can maybe just switch like half decaf and half regular, you know, just kind of slowly wean yourself so that you're not having, um, you know, side effects of withdrawal. Uh, okay, yeah, someone's asking, can I zoom the screen? I'm gonna try to do that again. Hopefully it's not gonna block my view of it. I don't know why it's doing that. Okay, there we go. Um, so eating fewer dairy products can help because the dairy, the dairy products can block absorption of magnesium. For a lot of people, yogurt is okay. Um, you know, because of the, the probiotics, it, it seems to end up having a, you know, um, a beneficial effect. But, you know, like I said, many people cutting out dairy and gluten and sugar can really help. And try to avoid any processed foods, fast foods, uh, too much red meat and too much salt. Okay, so that's step one is a nourishing um, whole foods diet. Step two would be movement and exercise. So, and you know, this does not have to be like going to a expensive gym or running, you know, training for a marathon, just the simple act of walking regularly, you know, as much, as much as possible can be very, very helpful when it comes to PMS symptoms, even if it's only like half a mile to a mile per day, um, that movement is going to help keep your hormone levels stabilized. And it's also going to help your body to eliminate any toxins, um, you know, because as your body's moving, as you're getting this exercise in, it's going to help your digestive system to move, help you to eliminate toxins. Also through the sweat, you're going to be eliminating toxins. And it's also going to help your body to absorb more nutrients. So, you know, like I said, it could just be walking for 30 minutes a day, you know, just taking a walk in your neighborhood or, um, you know, just doing something really simple like that, doing some stretches any type of movement, you know, is really going to help with your symptoms and shawl. Okay. So step three is a healthy lifestyle. So we have, um, first of all, you know, and obviously the, the diet and the exercise is part of your lifestyle. Um, but other things are things like sleep. So getting really good quality sleep and, um, you know, it's, I want to just emphasize that Many people may only get like five or six hours of sleep a night, <clears throat> a night, and they feel like that um, you know they're fine with getting that amount of sleep. But what studies have shown is what happens is people actually um, become their body kind of adjusts to getting that decreased amount of sleep, and to the point where they think they're okay. But then when studies are done and it tests like the person's you know, re, uh, reflex response, their memory, you know, their, um, uh, you know, ability to like make complex decisions. When they test all of those, it actually shows when they, when they're only getting five or six hours of sleep, it shows a really decreased, um, you know, performance on those, on those tasks. So a lot of times we think, oh, I'm fine with getting this less sleep, but, you know, actually it, we just, we're just not realizing the effect that it's having on us. So getting good quality sleep, meaning trying as much as possible to sleep early. Okay. So preferably after Aisha, you know, right after Aisha, if you can, um, definitely not past 10 PM if you can. Um, and, you know, I know when you have small kids and, you know, babies and, you know, you're up all night with children, obviously, you know, sometimes it's just not possible, but, um, as much as possible, you know, trying to sleep early because those early, you know, those hours right after Isha, like between 10 PM and midnight 
Um, the sleep is very high. The sleep that you're going to be getting during those hours is very high quality. So if, for example, a person went to bed at 10, okay, and then slept for eight hours or seven hours or whatever, and then another person went to bed at midnight, okay, and they still slept for seven or eight hours, that person who slept earlier, it's going to be have more positive effects, um, you know, on them because those early hours are so beneficial. So good quality sleep, going to bed early. Um, another thing that can really, really help is countering the effects of stress. So things like reading Quran, spending time in nature, practicing deep breathing exercises. This can really, really help to um, activate your parasympathetic nervous system, which is the part of your nervous system that's responsible for rest and relaxation and healing and digestion and all of these wonderful things. So we really need to counter all the stress in our life by trying to you know, activate that part of the nervous system that's gonna help us to calm down and focus. So um, deep breathing exercises, and then just making time for something that you love each day. Um, a lot of times, you know, as we get older and we're so busy with kids and spouse and work and all of these different things, and we kind of lose touch with the things that really, you know, bring us peace and things that we love to do. Um, a lot of times, if you look, think back to your childhood, and think back to, you know, what are the things that you love to do when you were little, you know, like, for example, for me, I grew up on a farm. So I love just being out in nature, you know, just climbing trees and running around and playing outside. And then when the weather was bad, you know, when it was raining or snowing or whatever, I would be inside, you know, curled up with a good book. So those were the kind of the two things like reading and spending time in nature. Those are the things that I love to do, you know, when I was growing up. And so just recently, I kind of um, started making time in my life for reading more. And it's really, really helped me to, to just um, kind of like get back to myself and, you know, for realizing, um, you know, the things that really help me to just relax and just kind of escape from, you know, the stresses of the day for a little bit. So, um, yeah, so just finding time, you know, for yourself each day, even if it's, even if it's just five or 10 minutes, you know, if you have small kids and there's really no time for yourself, even just taking like five or 10 minutes just to go in the other room, have some deep breathing, do some stretching, you know, maybe read something, whatever it is, you know, any hobby that you have just to kind of, um, get, you know, give that time for yourself. And then you can also use your PMS symptoms to help you get in touch more with your inner self. So oftentimes the root of PMS can be traced to how we view ourselves and all of these negative images of our menstrual cycle that have been, you know, that the society around us has imprinted into our subconscious. So, um, you know, if you've always been surrounded by women, you know, your sisters or mothers or aunts or friends who are always, you know, talking about this time of month as if it's, um, you know, basically focusing on all of the negative of, you know, the, you know, the symptoms that they may be having or you know, how they're not feeling well. And then you kind of grow up with this idea that, okay, this is a horrible time, you know, rather than, and, and we'll talk in a little bit later about how you can kind of view it in a more positive way, but just um, kind of, you just trying not to focus all of your attention on the negative of it. Um, and then lastly, just to get your thyroid checked. So a significant number of women who have really severe PMS, they do have some sort of thyroid dysfunction. So, um, you know, getting that checked out, even if you, maybe you don't have a lot of the other symptoms of thyroid, but sometimes this can be a way that, you know, that it initially manifests. Okay, I'm just gonna minimize this for one second, because I want to look at, I can't see the chat when I have it on full screen. Um, uh, yeah, so some, some, there were a few questions about sleep. So if you, when I say getting enough sleep, I also mean like if you, for example, between Duhur and Asr, you take a nap, that's, that's also included in that seven or eight hours. So that's fine, you know, and it was the sunnah, right, to, to it is the sunnah to sleep, um, in, to take like a light nap, short nap between Duhur and Asr. So that's okay. That can be also like included into the total time. 
And yeah, it said science says seven to nine hours per day. Um, and, you know, sleeping, you know, after Isha, as much as possible after Isha. Okay. Okay, so yeah, this is what I was mentioning about, you know, the mind is a very, very subhanAllah, very powerful, a very powerful thing. And sometimes just changing the script. So rather than, you know, looking at this time of the month as, you know, I'm going to be feeling miserable, I'm going to be having cramps and, you know, food cravings and all of this, trying to kind of change that script and focus on the positive of it. So um, look at this time of month as this amazing opportunity to rest and to take care of yourself. So view it as, okay, now this time of month is coming. Now I'm going to just bring my attention in. I'm going to focus on myself and my own needs. I'm going to get as much rest as I can. Um, I'm going to, you know, maybe give some extra time for myself, for, you know, for things that really make me happy. And subhanAllah, you know, this monthly process is, it's a sign, right? It's a sign from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pointing to the miraculous process of childbirth, because without this um, monthly cycle, you know, if like other Allah, something happened and you, you know, you, you were no longer having your monthly cycle, you wouldn't be able to, to, um, you know, get pregnant. You wouldn't be able to have children. Right. So it's just part of this whole miraculous um, process. And then, you know, once a month, there's this process of shedding going on. Right. So use that time of shedding as a reminder of kind of your own self renew renewal. So ask yourself, you know, each month at the beginning of, of your cycle, ask yourself, what is it in my life right now? What is it that I need to let go of, um, you know, in, in this time of my life? What is it that's no longer serving me? Um, what is it that's getting in the way of me living my life more mindfully and, you know, as the best possible version of myself? Okay. Sorry, I have this problem when I'm making the screens big. It's really hard to navigate and sorry about that. Okay, so um, I wanna talk a little bit about supplements that can help with PMS. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm always an advocate of first, we start with diet and lifestyle. Um, because, you know, you can't, you basically, you can't out supplement, um, you can't make up for a very poor diet using supplements, right? So, you know, if you're, um, if you're really not paying attention to your diet and not really take, you know, taking care of yourself in terms of your diet, no amount of supplements are really going to be able to reverse the effects of that. So, um, starting with diet first, starting with sleep, starting with, you know, getting some more exercise, all of these things. And then we can, you know, consider adding supplements just to kind of give that extra boost. Let me get this, enlarge this so you can see that better. Okay, so um, one of my favorite ones is called Vitex or Chasteberry. And this supplement um, is used to help balance your estrogen progesterone ratio. So remember we said at the beginning that oftentimes the severe PMS symptoms are caused by too much estrogen in the system. So the, this uh, chaste berry can help to um, kind of balance out that ratio. Uh, vitamin B6, which is also involved in estrogen metabolism. Um, another one is a natural progesterone cream. And this can help to balance hormones. And um, this is something that you can speak to your doctor about, but doctors often suggest starting, um, sorry, let me just minimize that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Doctors often suggest starting after ovulation and using it until the day before your period begins. Um, so as I said, you know, this is something that you can talk to your doctor more, get more details about using this. And then another one is magnesium. So magnesium is required in the metabolism of estrogen. And so it can help to relieve cramping. 
Um, you can either use a magnesium spray, which is my, my favorite way to take magnesium, is a magnesium spray on the skin, or you can take a supplement such as magnesium glycinate, which is, um, has good uh, absorbability. And then there's also some herbs and essential oils that you can use for PMS. Let me make this big for you. Okay, so these are some of my favorites. Uh, red raspberry leaf, dandelion root and dandelion leaf, nettle, which by the way, nettle is also very useful um, if you're anemic for helping to raise the iron. Nettle is re it's really good for that. Um, ashwagandha, which is, in, which is what we call an, an adaptogenic herb and can really help, um, especially if you're, if you're dealing with a lot of stress in your life, this, these types of herbs can really help your, basically to protect your body from the effects of all the stress that you're um, experiencing in your life. Uh, holy basil or tulsi, licorice root, ginger, oat straw leaf, chamomile. And um, another one of my favorites is marshmallow root, which is, you know, really safe. You know, even kids can take this. It's a really safe one. Um, and marshmallow root can help reduce bloating and water retention. And then some essential oils for PMS. So clary sage oil, cypress oil, lavender oil, uh, lang lang oil. And what you can do is, so you never want to take the essential oil just straight and put it directly on your skin because they can be very, um, you know, very strong it can cause some irritation to the skin. So you always want to dilute it with a carrier oil. So you can use like um, coconut oil, um, olive oil, almond oil, any, any of these types of natural oils, you can dilute it. And you can either just mix two to three drops of the essential oil with the carrier oil, and then you can rub it directly on your lower abdomen. Or another way, this is what um, I like to do for my daughter is I'll take like a hot water bottle or you know any type of warm compress. And um, the hot water bottle that we have, it has like um, a cloth covering on the outside. And so I'll just take a couple drops of the essential oil. Um, we use the clary sage oil and I'll put it on that, um, on that outside cloth cover of the hot water bottle. And then she'll just put that against her lower abdomen. And that can really help with uh, cramping and, um, you know, abdominal symptoms. Okay. okay. So um, I want to kind of switch gears now and talk about our alignment. Okay. And how alignment can really, really uh, um, affect the PMS symptoms. So. Um, these are five kind of habits that you can um, implement in order to have a more healthy pelvis and pelvic floor, which is really going to affect um, you know, your menstrual symptoms. So number one is ditch the heels. So any type of heel, you know, even if it's just like a very small heel, okay, it's going to basically put off your alignment. So, in, you know, and I'm sure that you've noticed yourself, like when you're wearing high heels, how your body has to kind of um, compensate, you know, basically in order to keep you upright, you have to basically change your alignment, right, in order to um, walk in those high heels. And so that, you know, people who are, you know, obviously if it's just, um, you know, you're going to a, a wedding or, and you're just going to wear it for a few hours in the evening, you know, it's not going to be that big of a deal, but you know, there's people who are day in and day out, you know, going out to work and wearing these high heels for eight, 10 hours a day. And that can, that really, really, um, messes up your alignment. And so basically it affects your pelvic floor because, when you're constantly in the state of malalignment, um, you know, it's, it's going to affect the pressures and the, um, it's basically the strength of the pelvic floor. And so then, then that can make your PMS symptoms worse. So as much as possible wearing, uh, shoes with no heel. Okay. Um, number two, align yourself. I'm going to talk in a minute about how you can check your own alignment and how you can make sure that your, um, that your alignment is good inshallah. Uh, number three is walking. So as we mentioned before, walking 
try to aim for six to 10,000 steps per day can really help uh, keep your pelvis healthy. Um, as much as possible, stop using chairs. You know, they have this expression now that um, chairs like sitting is the new smoking, right? So there's so many, you know, people who are sitting a lot in, in chairs, um, it's increasing their risk of heart disease and, you know, stroke and diabetes and all of these chronic illnesses. It's basically been tied directly to, you know, the amount of hours per day that you're sitting. Um, if you do need to sit, we'll, we'll all we'll talk in a second about how to sit in a way that is going to help with your alignment. And, you know, another option, if you can, would be sitting on the floor. It's a lot healthier than sitting in a chair because, um, you know, if you think about it, when you're sitting in a chair, you're just kind of in the same position all the time, right? So that blood flow is not getting to your pelvic area. And when you're sitting on the floor, you know, you're going to be moving this way, that way, you know, you start to get uncomfortable after a minute or two. So you're kind of constantly changing your position. And so the, that blood flow to the pelvis is going to stay, you know, really healthy. So, um, you know, trying not to sit in chairs, sitting on the floor, you know, when possible. And then number five is squat often. So, you know, this is a position that I think our ancestors used to, you know, be in this position a lot more, you know, maybe when they would be grinding up wheat, you know, grinding up grains, or maybe crouching over a fire to cook food or whatever it may be. And, you know, if you see children nowadays, you know, they can easily just squat down and get back up again. Whereas for us, we're not used to being in this position. So it's really, um, you know, uncomfortable for us just because we're not used to it. So squatting down, as much as possible really helps to um, helps with that the health of the pelvic floor, and even you know when you're going to the toilet, being in that squatting position really helps eliminate you know um, prevent constipation and help with elimination. Which you know as we talked about before, it's so important with you know um, allowing your body to get rid of that excess estrogen in the system is that you need to have good elimination. Okay. All right, so talking about your alignment. So if you have to sit, try, so this picture on the left, you see her pelvis is tucked. And this is how most of us, when we sit, this is how we sit is we have our pelvis tucked, okay? And if you can just kind of do a little experiment, just sit like this with your, the, the woman on the picture on the left with your um, pelvis tucked and just think about, how your abdominal area feels when you're in that position. You notice how everything is kind of um, pushed together, cramped together in this position. And then the picture on the right, she's untucking her pelvis, okay? So the movement is not in the shoulders, in the upper body, it's in the pelvis. So she untucks her pelvis, this picture on the right. And you can notice if you just try that, notice how that feels now. The It's like you've opened up this space in your pelvis, right? So your organs are not all cramped together. You have the space now, even your breathing, you know, you have uh, more lung capacity. So as much as possible. And, and, you know, and this is something that it can take some time to get used to, because if you're used to always sitting like this picture on the left with your pelvis really tucked, um, basically the muscles and the abdominal wall are gonna become very weak because you're, you know, you're just not used to using those muscles. And so when you first try to make that change of untucking your pelvis, it's gonna, you're gonna feel kind of tired. Um, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna take a little while to build those um, core muscles back up. So, you know, just maybe, you know, a couple times a day, just start to try to be aware of this, you know, to, to sit for a minute or two untucked, and then, you know, you can gradually increase the amount of time. Um, it's also really important while you're eating to try to sit with your pelvis untucked um, or, you know, in a neutral, in a neutral position, because that's really going to help with your digestion as well. Because, you know, as I mentioned, when you're sitting tucked, all your digestive organs are just kind of cramped together and they don't have space to really function properly. So when you're untucking, now you open up all of the space for digestion. Okay, and um, this is a picture of 
um, your alignment when you're standing. Okay. So, and this is something that you can check for yourself at home. You can just stand in front of a mirror, turn to the side, stand in front of a mirror and you can take, um, like a, any like rope or like a measuring, uh, what do you call it? Measuring tape that is, you know, like a, the kind that's not the stiff kind, but the kind that's kind of more flexible. And you basically just put it where this dot, the dot at the top is, okay? You put it there right at the pelvis, okay? And you just let it hang down and then just look at yourself in front of the mirror. And when, if you look at this picture on the right, when that rope hangs down, it should come straight down from your pelvis, from your hip to your knee, <clears throat> excuse me, drink some water down to your knee and then down to um, the mid part of your foot. Okay, it should just be like a straight line going down. Whereas the picture on the left, this is how the majority of us are standing is basically we are standing with our pelvis forward, okay? And if you notice the rope going down, it doesn't even go through the knee at all, right? It goes in front of the knee and then it goes down. And I've, I've even seen some people, the line goes way out in front of their toes, okay? So you want to try to back your hips up so that it resembles this picture on the right where the line, the rope is just going straight down through your knee and to your ankle, okay? And um, why, do, why is this happening? The picture on the left, why is everyone standing that way? Well, it's basically a result of us sitting too much because what happens is when we're sitting all of, this, all of the time, these muscles in the back of our legs, we're not using them as much as we should be. And because of that weakness, rather than standing with proper alignment, we're just kind of leaning forward into our hips and putting our weight into our hips. Um, so, you know, by making the conscious intention to back your hips up, to correct your alignment, and then at the same time, you know, trying not to spend so much time sitting, this can help to, you know, to correct that alignment, inshallah. Okay, and another um, thing that you can use, which can be really helpful is castor oil packs. Okay, so these have been said to help detox the liver naturally. They uh, support uterine and ovarian health and they improve your lymphatic circulation and also help to reduce inflammation. So with the castor oil packs, um, first of all, if you have very heavy bleeding, um, you know, during your period, then you, you do not want to do this during your period um, because it can increase, you know, the, the, uh, your amount of bleeding. So if, if that's not a problem for you, if you don't have very heavy bleeding, they say that it's okay to do it during your period, but um, just be aware that it may increase your flow. And so basically what you want to do is you want to take a piece of cotton flannel, okay, and you want to thoroughly soak it in the castor oil. So it's not going to be like completely saturated. It's not going to be like dripping with oil, but it's just going to be, um, you know, thoroughly soaked. And one way that you can do this is you can just take like a mason jar and you can put the flannel inside the mason jar and then kind of squirt some oil in there, you know, until it's uh, saturated. Um, and then what you want to do is you want to, so you have to be careful with this because the castor oil, if it gets on any, you know, sheets or clothes or anything, it's going to stain it and it's going to be really difficult, you know, to, or almost impossible to get out. So you want to make sure you lie on an old towel or a sheet. Okay. And then you take that cloth, which has been saturated in the castor oil and you, place it on the desired body part. Okay. So for example, um, if you're doing this, you know, to help with menstrual symptoms, you can put it on your lower abdomen, but you can also put it like in your upper right abdomen to help detox the liver. Um, so you can like move it around in, in different locations. And so you put the cloth on, you know, the area that you want, and then you want to cover it with something to protect. Um, because then what you're going to do is you're going to apply heat to that area. Okay. So you want to protect, you know, whatever it is that you're using to provide heat, like a hot water bottle or whatever you want to protect that. So you can use, um, you know, it doesn't have to be anything fancy. It could just be like, uh, 
an old, you know, plastic grocery bag or anything like that. But basically you, you want to put that over the cloth. Okay. And then you add the source of heat. So it could be hot water bottle, um, an electric heating pad, a rice heating pad, you know, any, anything that provides heat, you're going to put that over the top and then you're just going to relax, just uh, lie on your back, preferably with your feet elevated. Um, and then just rest for between 30 to 60 minutes. And, you know, you can use that time to maybe read a good book or, um, you know, say your evening supplications, practice some deep breathing, you know, just use it kind of as a time for yourself where you're just going to relax. Um, and then after that 30 to 60 minutes, you're going to, you can just remove the um, flannel and you can just put it back into that glass um, mason jar and you can just store it in there. And then, you know, it, that's, you can reuse it, um, you know, before like getting rid of the flannel, you can reuse it a bunch of times. And then um, basically, and you know, you, because as I said, that oil can stain. So you just want to make sure that, you know, you don't get it on anything. And then you can just use like a natural soap or you can use like a mixture of baking soda and water to remove any of the oil that's left on your skin. And, um, and then, you know, just keep in mind after, like for the rest of the day, after you do this, just make sure to kind of relax and rest because, you know, your body's going to be detoxing. So you want to make sure you drink enough water and stay hydrated, um, you know, so that you can kind of support that detox. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, I, we have a little bit of time left for questions, so I'll go back and look at the chat. Um, I just wanted to remind everyone that, um, you know, as I mentioned, this uh, course, you know, there's no, this course is free, it's completely free, but I'm, I started a fund to help divorced sisters in need, okay, and I have posted that, um, the link for that on the group, and I just wanted to, you um, just really quickly let you know, um, you know, obviously anonymously, but so basically there are three sisters here in Saudi. Um, one is a revert with four kids, mashallah. The other has six kids. The other has two kids, mashallah, um, who are really struggling, you know, who have been divorced and who are really struggling. There's another revert sister in China who, um, I mean, mashallah, although she has a university degree, she covers and in China, you know, in the area that she's in, in China, whenever she tries to get a job and, she, you know, they see her resume and they, you know, think, oh, you know, this looks like a great candidate. And then subhanAllah, she comes for the interview and they see that she covers and it's like, you know, see you later. We don't even want to even consider you subhanAllah. Um, and then there's another sister in the States who is currently fighting for custody of her kids. So it's really, um, you know, really difficult situation. So um, as I said, I'll put, I put the link on the group, please, you know, donate generously to help out these sisters, inshallah. And okay, so let me go through some of the questions. Just open the chat. I mean, I mean, to your dua. Um, okay, someone asked how often. I assume you're asking about the uh, castor oil packs. So um, usually like about once a month, you know, you, you don't want to do it too often because it is pretty powerful detox. So, you know, you don't you have to be careful that you're not doing it too often. But that's what I've seen recommended is about once a month. Um, at the end of the periods, does meat help with weakness? Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I, I think especially um, what I like to use is liver. If you can find a good quality uh, source for liver, you know, it can be chicken liver, um, beef liver, you know, it, it doesn't matter, but it's this is really going to help, you know, especially for women that struggle with anemia. The, um, liver can really help, you know, to increase their iron and help, you know, with um, vitamin A and B vitamins and things like that. Okay, um, 
Can the herbs be used instead of the essential oils? Can it be as effective? Um, so I assume that you're talking about like herbal tea, like consuming it through herbal tea. Well, the essential oil, it can be as effective, but the, you know, the essential oil, it's very, very concentrated. So for me personally, I find, um, you know, and there are like, um, mixes that I make with using herbs specifically for PMS, which I find to be really helpful. But when it's like the acute time, you know, when, when, like, for example, if you're really struggling with cramps or, you know, with, with bloating or digestive issues, I find that because the essential oils are so potent that it really, um, you know, helps to give you like quick relief. I think the herbs are more useful, for example, if you're drinking it, you know, like, let's say the week before, you know, you're expected to start your cycle and you're drinking it every day. And then that can really help, you know, to decrease the symptoms. Um, let's see. Okay. Someone asked, are all these relevant to 13 year olds having cramps and cravings and moodiness and feeling sleepy? Um, are, I, I, I'm not sure if you're asking about like the supplements or Rihanna, maybe if you can clarify what exactly are you, are you asking about like the essential oils or herbs or supplements or what exactly um, would you, yeah. So another, would you recommend teens to take supplements? Um, yes. So the, I'm just going to look back. I prob I don't know if I would recommend the natural progesterone cream for teens, but definitely like the magnesium, the vitamin B, um, even the Vitex would be okay. And the herbs, um, I'm just looking back at the list of herbs. So the ones that are, let me go back to this, like the licorice root, the marshmallow root, these are very safe, ginger, um, the red raspberry leaf, if it's a very young teen, I might not recommend. I actually had an experience with, uh, the red raspberry leaf one time I made it and I accidentally like brewed it very, very strongly. And it was really, really powerful. And I actually, um, I don't know, it just affected me in this very strong way. So maybe the red raspberry leaf, it, it, I would just brew it kind of lightly. Um, nettle is a very, very safe one for, for younger teens. So yeah, most of those are going to be okay. Um, okay. Let me just look through. Uh, yeah. Someone's asking about our alignment course. Uh, yes. Inshallah. Inshallah. We'll be running it again. Uh, okay. Yeah. So Rehana, you're asking about the supplements. Um, yeah, so I think I already, yeah, I think I already mentioned that. Um, sister is saying, I find turmeric and ginger tea very helpful with pain during menses. Yes, those are, because they're so powerfully anti-inflammatory, so it can really help. Uh, can we see supplement slide again? Sure. And I'll, you know, I'll be putting this, I'll be sharing this uh, recording, so you can always go back if you need to for anything. Okay, what is considered normal for cramps and bleeding? That's a good question. So um, what, I mean, what I have read is that it's kind of what's normal for you. So you can't really, because every woman is different, right? So, you know, some women, you know, mashallah, they don't, even have any cramps or they have very, very light bleeding and that's normal for them. But then if they reached a phase of their life where suddenly, you know, they start to have more severe cramps, more severe bleeding, then that's, that's not going to be normal for them. Right. So it kind of just, um, you know, it kind of just depends on what is your baseline. Okay. Okay, sorry, and a sister's asking for the slide with the vitamins. Yeah, I, I hope this is big enough. Tell me if you need me to blow this up more. 
But like I said, I'll be sharing it. So inshallah, you can always look at it later. Okay, so I see a couple of questions in the chat about PCOS. Um, is it possible to reverse or recover from PCOS with a healthy lifestyle and using natural remedies? Yes, I have seen, alhamdulillah, I have seen many cases uh, where women have been able to um, reverse, you know, using, and, and it's very similar to what we've been discussing today about the healthy lifestyle, you know, changing the diet, especially, um, you know, getting movement and exercise throughout your day, trying to deal with stress, managing your stress in a healthy way. And I have seen, alhamdulillah, I've seen like very remarkable, um, you know, recoveries from PCOS. So definitely it can be very helpful. Oh, hijama. Yes. Thank you, sister, for mentioning hijama can also be very helpful with, um, you know, because it, it's basically like a big, like a, a detox, right? So anything that's going to help your body to detox um, is going to help with your PMS symptoms. So that can definitely help. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, okay, sister's asking to see the symptoms slide again. Let me just go back. Here we go. Okay, uh, sister's asking, can we buy the cream from Amazon? I assume you're talking about the progesterone cream. Um, I haven't checked on Amazon. I'm sure it's there though, but I, I know on iHerb, you can get it from iHerb. Um, if you want, I can put a link on the group for one that I would recommend. Um, how much coffee can we have? So the thing about um, coffee and, you know, there are like studies out there that there can be some benefits to coffee, but the thing is that the caffeine. So when you have a cup of coffee, the half-life of caffeine is about six to eight hours, which means that let's say it's noon and you have a big cup of coffee. So at 8 PM that day, half of the caffeine from that coffee is still going to be going around in your system. So your body's going to only have cleared half of it. So, um, you know, imagine someone who like, you know, eight o'clock at night is having coffee and a lot of people will say, oh, well, you know, it doesn't affect me. Like I can, you know, drink a big cup of coffee at eight o'clock at night and I can still sleep fine. But the thing is, it's not just the initiation of sleep. It's also your quality of sleep. So when you're having that caffeine, it's, um, you know, you may be physically asleep, but the depth and quality of your sleep is not going to be as, as good. So, um, you know, preferably if you can switch to decaf or to herbal teas, um, or, you know, if you just feel like you absolutely can't live without it, try to just have in the morning, you know, like before the whole time, um, or, you know, at preferably, preferably before the her, the her time so that, you know, you can give your body, um, time to clear it. Okay. Uh, Turkish coffee. I don't know about Turkish coffee. I don't know. Maybe someone else knows. Does that have a lot of caffeine or I'm not sure about that. Okay. Um, there's some sisters asking about natural remedies for low thyroid. So um, yeah, maybe on the group, we can discuss that a little more because um, there's definitely, there's a lot of things that you can do to help support your thyroid. So we can discuss that more on the group, inshallah. Um, okay, so we are about out of time. So I'm going to, let me just end the recording.